This will be Laboratory 1314 on EMG and biofeedback. This is an interesting lab that looks at uh, muscle physiology a little bit and also a little bit about nervous physiology. So this is the first time this semester we're using special physiological equipment called the BioPack. The BioPack is a computer-assisted, what they call analog to digital or A to D board. Basically, it's a unit that allows us to collect physiological variables and record them on the computer. Uh, we need a number of different things to do this. We need a laptop or some sort of computer. That's the control unit that saves things. It's data processing. Uh, it will have a power cord and other accessories, potentially, like a mouse. And we need the BioPack equipment. Uh, like I said, it's called an analog to digital uh, board. Uh, what, if you think about it, what can computers really read? They can only read numbers and really just zeros and ones. So we have to take what's called analog data, your heart rate, your EMG, your breathing depth or something like that, and convert it into zeros and ones so the computer can read. So the BioPack uh, unit does that. The BioPack unit is shown in this picture right here, this blue thing that has the manual sitting on top of it. Right, so this little blue thing, that's the A to D board. So that hooks up into the computer, and then we'll take peripherals like this. This is uh, for the electro, so there's three wires here. And this would hook into uh, the computer. And so uh, it connects directly to the computer, and it allows us to, to collect the data we want. All of these things here are peripherals that allow us to look at different measurements uh, for uh, different experiments and we'll see the biopack a number of different times this semester in terms of collecting data uh, physiologically uh, generally speaking when we have the, the biopack uh, we'll set it up uh, we'll have a human volunteer uh, so we'll do experiments obviously on ourselves then um, the Lessons are called BSL lessons. That stands for BioPack Student Lab. Uh, the lessons we'll do in this experiment for the BioPack are lesson one for the EMG and lesson 14 for the biofeedback. And you'll have to attach the, the peripherals, the electrodes, the leads, and, and anything else you need. You'll follow directions. The, BioPack has uh, screen prompts on it for the computer that will tell you what to do. You'll collect the data, and when you're done, we'll analyze the data and kind of look at what we uh, see and what we expected and, and what's happening physiologically. So one of the experiments we're going to do on the BioPack is an EMG. EMG stands for electromyogram. Break it down, it means electro refers to electrical, myo, muscle, gram, recording. So it's a recording of the electrical activity within a muscle. Uh, what we're primarily measuring are action potentials. Action potentials are the way we typically signal uh, electrically in the nervous system. And so it includes the action potentials coming down the motor neurons, and the action potential is going down the muscle fibers itself. And generally speaking, uh, within a given muscle group, the more electrical activity we have, the greater strength it will generate. Uh, interestingly enough, that's not exactly true from person to person or even from uh, a left side limb to a right side limb uh, because there's other factors that determine uh, muscle strength besides electrical activity. So the way the EMG works is we will set up electrodes. Now, the electrodes are pretty simple, and these always work uh, the same way, and just kind of show you here. 
because uh, we can see them pretty well. This will be true of the whole semester when we use electrodes. Uh, we're going to have three what they call leads, okay? And each lead connects to a little electrode, right? And what happens is these electrodes have little silver tabs on them, and you just pop on these quick little pop on and off electrode leads that make contact with it and record. The electrodes always have three uh, leads on them, and basically uh, one's a positive, one's a negative, and one's the ground. Okay, so the black's the ground, and then uh, the other two are the positive and negative. And what we do is we measure the electrical difference between the positive and negative lead. So what we're doing is we're measuring the electrical activity between these two, this red and this white, this area right in here. We're looking at those uh, muscles and the electrical activity between them. If you had set this up incorrectly and switched the red and the black, then we'd only be measuring the distance between those two and we'd measure a very small amount of electrical activity. So we're looking at this electrical activity here uh, between these, these two muscle, muscle groups. And the idea was in order to put these electrodes on is you want to have maximum contact with the skin. And so what we would do is we would wipe off the skin to get any oil off of it and uh, abrade it a little bit so we'd have better conduction between the skin and the electrode. In a hospital situation, they do a number of different things. They have a little, like, it looks like a little gun in it. What it does is it spins the electrodes against the skin. It actually measures the skin resistance in the electrode. And when it reaches the optimum level, it stops spinning. Um, we also have uh, uh, electrode gel that we can do to increase the, the conductivity as well. Uh, in a hospital situation, they often have, it looks like a little tape. And it's like um, uh, sandpaper. And what you do is you just rub it against the skin a little bit, and that makes a, a good contact as well. What you're trying to do is you're trying to get a good contact between the skin and the electrode. In extreme cases, uh, you may even shave somebody and get rid of the hair so you get better contact. Okay? Now, we wouldn't do that in class, but uh, you know it's, it's something that you could do. And the idea is... Uh, is you're going to have the person do this hand grip exercise. And when they do the hand grip exercise, they're going to go through various uh, stages where they get to larger and larger uh, grip strength. And so the idea is to measure five successive contractions, just like he's doing here. Notice there's nothing in his hand at this point. And the first contraction is supposed to be two seconds at 25%. So you can see it over here. Second contraction, 50% for two seconds. The third, 75% for two seconds. And the fourth, maximum for two seconds. So you go two seconds on, two seconds off. And, you know, sometimes you're going to give it a small, medium, large, and then max. And then what you're going to do is you're going to do a fifth clench. And you're going to put a grip strength. Uh, it's called a hand dynamometer, and it measures grip strength. And the person's going to squeeze it as hard as they can, and they're going to measure the strength of the actual grip. And we're going to uh, look at the electrical activity on the EMG. All right, so we're going to measure actually five of these little mounts. You can kind of see them here. And he's not doing a great job, but it looks okay. So the first one looks kind of small and this one looks a little bigger and this one looks like it's going to be a little bigger so we still got a couple more to go and then once we do it we'll start with the dominant hand and then when we're done we'll switch to the non-dominant and do it again all right to analyze the data what you're going to do is you're going to highlight the contraction so you can see right here the red where it starts and where it finishes you'd actually when you're all done on the computer highlight it and then the computer will get to calculate whatever you need. There's a whole bunch of different things. It's a great thing about this program. You can easily have a pull-down menu to calculate whatever you want. We want to calculate the area under this green curve here. It's called the mean for us. And we'll use that to kind of look at our data. So this is kind of how it looks like. This is a nice set of data here where we have the subject 
do a small, medium, large, max. The actual biopack information that comes with the program does not do the hand gripper max like we do. I actually have a different program that kind of looks at that, but we're going to um, not, uh, we're going to put them both together and, and not do them separately. In addition, you know, if you spend about, I don't know, it's like $1,500, you can get a gripper that, uh, you know, this is something that you probably get off of Amazon for like 15 bucks. For $1,500, right, uh, you can get uh, an electronic one that will measure grip strength. But, you know, this is good enough for us. So just get a number. And we can kind of figure things out from there, like efficiency. But what you're looking for is you're looking for a successive increase in the activity. And basically, we're not measuring grip strength for the first four, but we're assuming that it's stronger as we go up and it's associated with the increase in the activity. So then the idea would be, once you're done there, you're going to go and look at the data from the uh, response. I'll kind of, again, show you what you'll do, is you'll start with the cursor here, and you're just going to highlight this little mountain right to where it ends, and then the computer will display a set of numbers, and you just copy that number down. That number would be the mean value for the dominant arm for clench one. So this would be clench one, two, three, four. And again, we'd have a fifth clench for our data when the person's doing this. All right. And then we also have a place for number five. And we also have a place to put what the grip strength was as well. So this is kind of showing it. This is actually not something we did. It's something from Biopack. And so they show it highlighted. I don't think they did a very good job highlighting it. I would have started there and gone there, right, for the whole grip strength. There's this, like a little hill. Um, but that's basically what you do. And then it'll produce a number here, which we can't even see because the resolution's not good enough. But that's basically how you do it. Um, pretty simple. For the biofeedback experiment, we're going to look at heart rate and something called, it used to be called GSR. Nowadays, they call it EDA. Uh, they're the same thing. And uh, GSR is an older term. Some people still use it. GSR stands for galvanic skin response. And galvanic refers to electricity to some extent. Um, Galvani studied electricity and did a number of different uh, important things with uh, electricity. So GSR used to be used, but they've replaced that primarily with what they call EDA. EDA stands for electrodermal activity, and that makes it a little easier to kind of uh, uh, figure out what it is. So it's the, you know, again, break it down. It's the activity, right? Electro, electricity, right? So it's the electrical activity. Dermal, dermis, your skin. So it's the electrical activity in the skin. And so to do that, we have these little uh, electrodes where we're going to have uh, two electrodes. It's going to measure the difference in electricity, basically, between these, these two different points. Um, so basically, uh, what we're looking at is we're looking at sweat rate. And since sweat has electrolytes in it, uh, ions dissolved in water, the more sweat you have, the better it conducts electricity. So the higher the EDA, or if you want to call it GSR, the higher that will be. The other variable we're going to measure, I'm sure you're all familiar with, and we're going to measure heart rate. Measure heart rate with an ECG or an EKG. It's the same thing. It's an electrocardiogram. It's also electrical recording of the heart. And for this experiment, we're just going to use it to measure the actual heart rate pretty easy to measure on ECG. As a matter of fact, the heart rate can be measured. We can have the computer measure it for us, but I think it's better and more accurate to measure it by hand in most instances. Later on the semester, we will have some experiments where we look at heart rate and look at the ECG itself and measure some values from that. And so um, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to hook up these 
uh, electrodes on the fingertips. And then we're going to look at and hook up the ECG on the limbs. We're going to use what are called limb leads. Uh, we're going to put uh, uh, one on the, the right ankle, one on the left ankle, right above the medial malleolus, and then one on the right wrist, and kind of look at the that view. If you a study ECG is what they call modified V5 lead. Um, and it looks at the left ventricle, and so it gives us a, a pretty good idea of what's happening in ventricular activity, although certainly we can see atrial activity as well there. Um, so that's a standard view we're going to use in class the whole time. It's pretty easy. We just have to hook up to the you know, wrist and ankles and then get the fingertips uh, to get the other data. Data collection is really easy, and, and generally speaking, for bio. Uh, biopack experiments the whole semester. The data collection is really, really easy. Um, the data analysis tends to be the more difficult part, or pulling the data off uh, tends to be more difficult. So once we get everything hooked up, we'll make sure the heart rate and EDA is working. And then what you do is you measure the subject under three conditions. Uh, the first one is just have them sitting there relaxed with their eyes open. They're not talking, right? But they're just kind of sitting, hanging out. So you do that for about 30 seconds or so. Sometimes it needs to go a little longer. Sometimes, uh, you know, you want to go at least that long. When, and then when the person's sort of relaxed, and kind of just hanging out, you say, okay, now we want you to go in the maximum relaxation. So you want the person to kind of close their eyes, and try to relax and they're trying to go okay I'm going to bring down my heart rate I'm going to bring down the electrical activity of my skin and just kind of just try to do maximum relaxation and in almost every case I've never had a, a student that couldn't do it to some degree uh, heart rate and uh, EDA will go down during that maximum relaxation and sometimes it takes a minute or two, but you want them to do that. And it's hard because there's chatter on the lab and, and other things. And then without them knowing it, you're going to arouse them in a physiological sense. And so what we do is we startle the person. And, you know, there's different methods to do it. Like, you know, maybe somebody takes a book and slams it on the table. And, you know, they'll, they'll startle. And not surprisingly, heart rate and EDA both jump up significantly. And then you measure for a little while because you want to make sure that you get those increases. And um, the EDA tends to lag a little bit behind the heart rate in terms of changes. Heart rate tends to be fairly immediate. Like the EDA, you have to signal the sweat gland that has to release the sweat, and then the sweat has to get to the skin, and then that will change the EDA. So that usually lags behind. Uh, so uh, you want to record for another, you know, like 15 seconds after the startle. And then the data analysis for this one is actually pretty easy. Um, this isn't a very good recording again. I, we have some better ones. Um, and what you're looking for is this is supposed to be the heart rate, right? And it's all over the place. And this is supposed to be the EDA. Um, and so Actually, I think this is the EDA. Yeah, and this is the heart rate. Sorry. Um, on the computer screen that we have, I think, reverses this. I think it's reversed to what we use. Um, and so what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to pick the minimum point when they're most relaxed. And then, like before, it'll give you a value up here. Um, the nice thing is, and you won't see it here because these aren't colors, but these are color-coded uh, now on the newer Biopack program. Um, so one is in green and one is in blue or, you know, so the numbers up here match if you want something from the blue area uh, or if you want something from the green area, you just match the colors and it works pretty well. And what you do is you just measure the different points and figure out um, what the different variables were for EDA and heart rate. And then you're just going to go ahead and put them into the table and you'll be able to then analyze the data and see what was happening uh, during these different trials. So there's an example of the data that we see. And like I said, normally speaking, uh, 
heart rate goes down during relaxation and then during arousal jumps up and then the EDA goes down during relaxation and then during arousal jumps up. So this is pretty typical data that we would see. So let's continue on with the video and just go ahead and finish this, this one in one shot. I think that probably won't take too much more time. Let's start with the discussion of the EMG. And again, EMG is an electrical muscle recording. It stands for electromyogram. You have to remember it's a measure of electrical activity. It's not strength, but it is related to strength. And generally speaking, again, in the same muscle group, the more action potentials you have typically gives you a greater amount of strength. But someone who's really, really strong and someone who's not very strong, if we measured their action potentials through the EMG, it'd be very similar, even though one person might be twice as strong as the other. So it doesn't work across people. And it doesn't even work between your left and right limbs, to be honest, uh, because we tend to be more coordinated with our dominant arm. That's why it's our dominant arm. And so the action potential pattern tends to be a little bit different uh, in most people. Not everybody, but in, in most people. So the EMG is a measure of recording that's related to strength, but not really strength itself. Now, part of the reason why is we'll learn later in lecture that action potentials, these electrical events are caused by the movement of ions uh, in and out of the muscle cell itself. These electrical events are considered to be all or none events, meaning if we reach a threshold, the action potential occurs, and when it occurs, it's always the same size. It's the same height. It does the same thing every time. And so it either occurs or it doesn't. And if it occurs, it looks exactly the same as the previous one. So that means that my action potential also looks very similar to your action potential, if not close to exactly the same. And those action potentials, their size and, and, and their characteristics are largely dictated by the concentration of the different ions across your muscle cell. So the, the two most important ones are sodium and potassium. And if your sodium or potassium levels change too much enough, really, to change the way the action potential looks, then you'll start to have a, a disease state and probably wouldn't be sitting in class measuring action potentials uh, if you had that happen. And as a matter of fact, if it went too severe, which really isn't that big a change, it'll kill you. So um, we have to keep the, the level of ions fairly consistent within our body. Uh, and those are examples, again, of homeostatically regulated variables. A couple other things, you know, about this. Uh, remember, from anatomy, we have what are called motor units. So this demonstrates two motor units, right? Coming from the uh, ventral gray horn, right? Here's the blue one that goes. And notice one muscle fiber, right? So each uh, axon separates into an axon terminal, and there's only one axon terminal per, per skeletal muscle fiber. Here, this one motor unit goes to three muscle fibers. This one, in this example, goes to two. But there's only a one-to-one -one ratio. So if this blue motor unit got damaged, this nerve right here, these muscles would no longer contract. Skeletal muscles contract independently of each other, um, it takes the motor unit to be able to contract them. And so if I send a signal down this motor neuron, it'll go to both of these and cause them to contract. If I send one down the green one, it'll go to all three of these and it'll cause it to contract. But if I excite the green ones, they don't cross over and excite the blue ones. Each one has to be excited individually by its own motor unit. Now, that's a pretty good example of the three, sorry, four successive measurements of the clenches, right? And uh, again, we don't see the fifth one because BioPack does not do that part of the experiment as lesson one. It's actually in lesson two um, of, 
of the bio pack we just combine them because really you can just do it and just do an extra couple seconds and it works pretty well um a couple things that you know we can look at that we won't to be honest one is the little bit of line in between the different cleanses that's called tonus or muscle tone uh, our muscle tone is maintained with some electrical activity when we're not contracting um, for various reasons but uh, what we're going to really focus on are the actual electrical activity for each clench okay so we're going to measure electrical activity for each clench um, when we look at the different increasing strengths right or, sorry it's not strength increasing uh, electrical activity you're might wonder okay what's going on there why do we increase electrical activity well very simply a scientific way to describe the increase in activity in any activity you can describe it as summation so summation is just easily defined as an increase in activity so here since we're measuring the EMG and we're measuring the electrical activity of a muscle we see that we have an increase in the electrical activity so we have summation because we can see it gets bigger right and here's the mean this bottom these little mountains we measure the area under the curve that's the mean we'll see it gets bigger right so we have no doubt we have an increase in activity so we have summation once we've determined we have summation we can narrow it down into two potential types of summation okay the first one is called spatial summation. It looks like it's spelled spatial, but it's pronounced spatial summation. And in spatial summation, the good one word thing to put in your head for this is recruitment. So we have an increase in the number of active units. So in this case, say spatial summation is an increase in the number of muscle fibers. So as an example, maybe for the the first contraction we have only these blue ones contracting and then for the second one we have these blue and green ones contracting at the same time so that would be spatial summations they're adding together to give us a bigger response All right so that's spatial summation so it's an increase in the number of active units and again think of increased recruitment the other type of summation is called temporal summation. And temporal refers to time, like if something was temporary, I mean, it only lasts a short amount of time. And in temporal summation, we don't have an increase in the number of units, but each unit does more work. So we have a higher frequency of stimulation. So in temporal summation, this shows the baseline, right? So this might be the frequency at the 25%, the first contraction and then this could be the second contraction we have a higher frequency of stimulation okay so that's called temporal summation and what's interesting about this experiment is studies have shown that these increases here these steady increases at 25 50 75 percent and a maximum contraction which yields the maximum emg that this is due to both temporal and spatial summation. And as a matter of fact, do a little uh, experiment right now. Uh, you know, take your hand off your mouse or your device, whatever it is, at least one of them, and gently squeeze your hand. All right, and just go ahead and make a fist and squeeze a little bit and feel like where the muscles are contracting. And then take it and squeeze as hard as you can. And what you'll feel is you'll feel that muscle activity goes and radiates towards the outside of your uh, arm so the medial and lateral side you can feel you have more muscular activity and while we can't measure it the way we do we'd actually have each muscle fiber would send a faster volley of action potentials uh, as well so studies show that that summation we see is due to both spatial and temporal summation but the way we conduct our experiment, we have no ability to distinguish between those two types of summation with the way we do the experiment. Uh, later on, we will do another experiment where we can 
in a frog at least, um, differentiate between spatial and, and temporal summation because we're going to have external stimulus uh, and not the internal stimulus that we're using here. One way to think of spatial and temporal summation is to kind of think of a bank of lights that um, have dimmers as well as switches. Okay, So as an example, if we put all of the, the lights at uh, maximum, right, I'll you know, just have them all at the same uh, intensity, and then flipped a switch, right, then we'd have, you know, one of the three, we'd have one bank of lights on, and that would be our, our light. And then we flip another switch, and that turns another bank on, and our overall light increases. Okay, So as we increase the amount of light by turning on more lights, that's spatial summation. However, right here, we see the dimmer switches, right, on, on this, this one or down here. So by taking the dimmer switches and turning them up, we can make each individual light that's already on brighter. That would be temporal summation. Each light is giving a greater output of light. Um, each light is doing more work, basically. So it's kind of not a bad way to think about temporal and spatial summation. So the idea for this is to take these measurements and uh, look at the mean uh, value uh, and fill it in for the dominant arm for all four clenches plus the extra fifth clench. And then for the non-dominant arm, do the same thing and then compare them. One of the comparisons, which really isn't a very good one, but this is what the biopack information asks us to do, is to take what's called the percent difference or the percent increase. Uh, it's not always an increase, it could be a decrease. And for our purposes, the way we'd calculate that for our data here is you do it for the dominant arm first, and you would take clench four, whatever number you got from that. Typically, it's right around 0.2, right? And subtract whatever number you got for clench one. It, this will be smaller because they're supposed to progressively get larger. So let's say this is 0.05. So 0.2 minus 0.05 divided by clench 1. That's still 0.05. So 0.2 minus 0.05 is 0.15 divided by 0.05 would be 3. And then you multiply it by 100 to get to that percent. So it would be 300. So you have a 300 times increase for uh, uh, that number. So uh, let's kind of look at it really quick. Uh, and we'll, we'll look at the data a little more intensely and do it again with writing numbers out. Okay, so let's say that this one was 0 0.05. And let's say clench 4 is 0 0.20. All right, and then these would be, it wouldn't probably be 0.10 and 0.15 in a perfect world it would, but nobody's perfect. So we have our, our clench 4 value, right? Our clench 4 value is this number right here. And our clench 1 value is this number right here. So we just set it up, and I'll do it over here. So our clench 4 value is 0 0.2, 0 0.20 minus 0 0.05 divided by 0 0.05 times 100. And again, that's just, I can do this in my head, so I picked these numbers. 0.2 minus 0 0.05 is 0 0.15 divided by 0 0.05 would be 3 times 100, so that would equal a 300% increase in EMG activity. Okay. And that's pretty typical. We typically see between 300 and 600 percent increase between clench 4 and clench 1. Okay. And again, we expect it to be bigger. Otherwise, we wouldn't have accepted the data. Um, so you would write 300 percent here. So 
of 300 percent then you do the same thing over here for the non-dominant arm and here's the problem with it the problem is that one of the variables that we have is not very consistent and that's clinch one clinch one is what we call a sub maximal response and sub maximal responses are not very repeatable uh, we don't do them scientifically very often and we don't do them even in medical tests uh, for two reasons one reason is that they're not very repeatable so if you ask somebody to to do a 25 percent clench every day for the whole semester you're gonna get a wide variety of data um, if you ask somebody to do a hundred percent clench every day for the whole semester that data will be variable, but it'll be much more consistent. The other reason why we do the, the maximal tests for you know medical tests and, and scientific tests is those are the ones that will tax the system the most. And so, especially medically, if you're looking for a weak spot in the system or something that's not working properly, it'll be most often shown um, when the body is doing maximal work. Um, so. Uh, these numbers would get bigger as we go down on both sides, although certainly they're not going to go up in the same increments because, again, we're not machines, so we're not going to be perfect. The question is, which has a larger electrical activity? Well, again, it matters on which one you're looking at, right? Are you looking at um, clinch one, two, three, four, right? Well, the only one that really makes sense to compare would be clinch four because that should be the max, right? So they're supposed to do 100% of uh, strength at the max. And what we see is that oftentimes, probably close to two-thirds of the time, the non-dominant arm has the biggest EMG. So at maximum, this actually, not always, but often, about two-thirds of the time, has the higher EMG. What's interesting though, and we'll get into this in a second, if we measure grip strength, then the dominant arm has the highest strength. So how do we equate the two? Well, one good way to, to measure and compare the two is with a variable we call efficiency. And there's a different ways to measure efficiency, and often in a muscle it's measured with oxygen consumption and power output. But we're going to look at strength in, in EMG, and we can use that to measure uh, a bit of efficiency. So here's an example of EMG activity. This, this one's actually pretty high. And this makes the point that I said. So this is real data from a, a student, previous student. And we see that at maximum, right, we have the non-dominant arm, the EMG is 0.42. And the dominant arm is only 0.34. And the reason why this happens typically is the dominant arm is a dominant arm because it's the one we're most used to using. And so if you are asked to recruit muscle fibers maximally, it's something you tend to be familiar with and you're a little more uh, efficient at it. Um, and so you'll have the ability to uh, recruit uh, and do what you need to do without a whole lot of, of error. When you try to do the non-dominant arm, it's not as uh, used. Uh, it's a more novel, if you want to look at it that way. Uh, practice and so what happens is the person tries to do whatever they can to generate as much strength as they can so they get this big output of, of electrical activity that doesn't result in as much strength typically um, usually if you measure the grip strength of somebody on the left or not the left the dominant versus the non-dominant side um, they're generally significantly stronger on the dominant side So another way to kind of measure percent change would be to use the dominant side as your control and your non-dominant side as your experimental. And so the general formula for percent change is 
experimental minus control divided by control times 100. So again, I'll put it up here. Experimental minus control divided by control times 100. And before our experimental and control, we just replaced it with clench 1 and clench 4. So our experimental would be this number at max. Our control would be this number. So you get 0.42 divided by, sorry, minus 0.34. So you give me 0.12. Right, 0.12 divided by 0.34 would be like uh, 0.38-ish. I'm not looking at calculator, I'm just guessing, times 100. So you got like a 38%, which is a pretty big difference, 38% difference between these two values. Right, pretty big difference um, for that. So that's another way to, to look at it. And again, the best clench to compare is the maximum one because that's repeatable. Right. Uh, another way to to look at oh sorry twenty three percent hmm right, my math was wrong oh it's not point one two it's that's okay I can't, I can't add it's point oh eight right so that's why so twenty three percent difference still pretty big difference though in terms of dominant and non dominant. And again, the, the non-dominant is less efficient, and it requires, uh, you know, more effort for uh, less familiar pathways, basically. And that's why people exercise train, so they can get those pathways more familiar, and then they can do what they need to do. So you can calculate the percent increase. We've, we've done that already. Um, you can see that for this data, right? big percent increases but again these first values they're not really great values because they're submaximal um, the other thing we could do is we could calculate the efficiency all right so as an example uh, let's do that here and I'm gonna make up data because I don't have it um, to be honest uh, for this so the other piece of data that we have is the strength of contraction off the gripper and let's say that this person did 40 kgs for their dominant arm and usually you know people are somewhere between 5 and 15 percent less so let's say they're 10 percent less so let's say this is 36 kgs all right now what happens then to measure efficiency is we divide basically the um, strength divided by the activity so basically you take the 40 kgs and divide by the 0.34 so to get their efficiency you go 40 divided by 0.34 and that's going to give me 118 we're going to compare it to, to this one so we're going to get 36 divided by 0.42 and this is going to be 86 the higher the number the more efficient somebody would be and basically it says all right not exactly, but um, you need so much electrical activity to generate this force. This person needs or is not efficient. So with a given amount of electricity, this person has a much higher efficiency than this person because this number is significantly higher. Now, we're not talking about people. I guess this, this one is dominant arm versus non-dominant. So the dominant arm is much more efficient because it's a higher number. So it's kind of not a bad little thing. It's easy to measure and it gives us an idea of, of efficiency.
So that's the EMG part. Let's go to the biofeedback, which is kind of an interesting one. Um, when we look at this experiment, it's not really biofeedback. What we're really looking at is we're looking at the autonomic nervous system. This is a great experiment for the autonomic nervous system and uh, how we're measuring it. Uh, here's an example of the electrode. This this is, could be lead two if you look at uh, Eindhoven's triangle, but uh, oftentimes people call it a modified V5. Um, but again, we have an electrode, um, the negative electrode on the right wrist, right? So this would be the white one. We have the positive electrode, that would be the red one on the left leg. And then you would have a ground, typically it could be anywhere, but you put on the right leg and the, the right ankle. So remember, they're right above the medial inside malleolus those are the ankle bones this one's just sitting on the on the wrist and you'll get a nice uh, measure of heart rate if this is all set up now the fault heart rate is set by the SA node those autorhythmic cells right and we'll learn more about that this semester and it is adjusted by changes in the autonomic nervous system uh, primarily the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system the EDA, the electrical electro, electrodermal activity, is controlled by the ANS as well. Uh, but in this case, uh, it's a measure of sweat rate. And sweat glands, and to be honest, most of the periphery, um, when you get out to the limbs, is controlled by the sympathetic nervous system. So EDA is strictly a measure of sympathetic nervous system activity because there's no parasympathetic innervation, there's no parasympathetic fibers that go to sweat glands. So it has no effect on sweat glands. But for the heart rate, it is affected differentially by the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. And in fact, most students don't know this from their previous classes, it depends on the heart rate as to which system tends to have the most effect. So just looking quickly at the nervous system, uh, it's easy to break things up into pairs of things. So the nervous system can divide up into central and peripheral. Central nervous system, we can divide up into the brain and spinal cord, right? And the peripheral nervous system, we can divide into afferents and efferents. Afferents, afferents are sensory fibers, efferents are motor. The efferents, we can divide up into two, somatic, which are voluntary, and then the autonomic, which are the involuntary. The autonomic nervous system, we divide up into sympathetic and parasympathetic. Generally, these are two antagonistic pathways that do the opposite things. Uh, this just looks at a little differently. We're not going to worry too much about this for lab because we'll get into these for lecture. Um, so afferent and efferent sound the same, so be careful. Afferent literally means to carry towards, so afferent brings information to the CNS. Efferent means to carry away, so that brings information away from the CNS. So afferent are your sensory neurons, and efferent are your motor neurons. All right, so the way you some people remember that is the acronym SAME, right? So sensory afferent, S-A, and then motor efferent, M-E, they go together. So I don't know if that helps you or not, but perhaps you remember. So when we look at the nervous system, we're really mostly worried today about the sympathetic and parasympathetic. And the sympathetic nervous system is sometimes known as the fight or flight, and the parasympathetic is sometimes known as the rest and digest. Um, so those are the, the, the two parts of it, and we're really going to worry about uh, how they affect the heart and how they affect sweat. Uh, both the sympathetic and parasympathetic go to the heart, so they can affect it differentially. If we stimulate the sympathetic nervous system, that will speed up the heart. If we stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system, that will slow down the heart. And then, again, we don't worry about the parasympathetic to sweat glands because there's no parasympathetic fibers that go there. So it's only sympathetic innervation that we worry about. And this one's really easy. If we increase sympathetic stimulation, we increase sweat. So our EDA will go up with sympathetic 
stimulation. If we decrease it, we'll decrease sweating, and that will go down. Um, if you look at this experiment in uh, a lot of different ways, it's actually, depending on who's doing it, about half of what a lie detector test would be. So these are two variables that are commonly measured in lie detector tests, your EDA and your heart rate. So uh, here's an example of the antagonist to control of heart rate. The parasympathetic, right, um, has an inverse effect on heart rate, and the sympathetic has a direct effect. So if we increase the sympathetic, we get an increase in heart rate. If we decrease the sympathetic, we get a decrease in heart rate. The inverse effect on heart rate for the parasympathetic is if we increase the parasympathetic, heart rate goes down. If we decrease the parasympathetic, heart rate goes up. So think of these as the accelerator, the sympathetic, and the brake, the parasympathetic, just as in your car. So if you're driving down the freeway and you're maybe going a little too fast and out of the corner of your eye you see that you passed a police car. And so you want to slow down but you don't want to make it obvious for the police to see that you're slowing down. So most people, instead of pushing the brake, where your brake lights light up and tells the cop, hey, I was going too fast, right? If they're not paying attention, they draw attention to you. You do what? You take your foot off the accelerator. My point being, there's two ways to slow your car. One is to put on the brake, and the other is to take your foot off the accelerator. And so the same thing is true for the heart. There are two ways to slow your heart. One is to put on the brake, increase the parasympathetic. The other way is to decrease the sympathetic, to decrease the accelerator. What's interesting is the various control of heart rate that depends on your actual heart rate range. And so at rest, when the heart rate's below 100 beats per minute, it's mostly the parasympathetic system that plays a role. And so if we're below 100, we're going to assume that most of the changes in heart rate are due to changes in parasympathetic. So if heart rate went from 70 to 90, heart rate went up, you go, oh, we've increased heart rate, but we're below 100. Since we're below 100, it's the parasympathetic system that dominates, right, right here. Parasympathetic, oops, sorry, I'm not throwing away. Parasympathetic system that dominates, right? And so that means that we have a decrease in the parasympathetic to increase heart rate below 100. Now, if heart rate went down, went from 90 back to 70, we're still below 100, which means we're still the parasympathetic. And that means to decrease heart rate, we have to increase parasympathetic, right? Let's say we're out running and your heart rate's 140 beats per minute, okay? And then all of a sudden you speed up and go to 160. What was that? Well, above 120 beats per minute, the sympathetic system dominates. So increases in heart rate going from 140 to 160 would do, be due to an, primarily an increase in sympathetic nervous system. Then you slow back down to 140, right? Since we're still above 120, that means the sympathetic system is still the dominant system. And then heart rate decreases due to a decrease in sympathetic. Right? If you look at the middle of that range, 100 to 120, it's about 50-50. So increases in heart rate would do between 100 and 120 would be due to an increase in sympathetic and a decrease in parasympathetic. And these aren't exclusive, right? You know, there's still a small percentage at the extreme ends of the other one, but we're going to say primarily it was due to the system. So sweat is controlled exclusively by the sympathetic nervous system. And this one's really easy again. We increase the sympathetic nervous system, we increase sweat. And we decrease the sympathetic nervous system, we decrease sweat. Right? And then sweat determines EDA. So if we increase sweat, we increase EDA. Right? And so right here, right, we see for a scene from airplane, right, where the sympathetic nervous system's going a lot, right, to produce a lot of sweat here. So here's an example of the data that we again can typically see. Um, 
we see a control value, right? This is when the person, remember, had their eyes just sitting there, um, kind of just hanging out, eyes open initially. And then the relaxation was like, I close their eyes, try to go in their little happy place and just try to decrease heart rate, and just relax. And then what the peak heart rate was during arousal when somebody banged something on a table or something, a book or yelled, okay? So we'll see in, in all cases, our control will be sort of the, the number we compare to. So relaxation, the heart rate went down 13 beats. And then from the control with arousal, the heart rate went up 18 beats. And then we look here from the control, relaxation, the EDA went down, you know, a little over two, right? Don't worry about the units too much. And then from control to arousal, it more than doubled, okay? So the question is, all right, so what happened to these variables, right? And then why, right? So we just went over what happened to them. Let's talk about the why part. I like to do EDA first. And even though it's a variable that's less familiar to students, it's much easier to deal with because it's direct effect. So EDA, we went from control 2.57 to 0.42. So it decreased. So I have a decrease in EDA. So right here, I'm going to write decrease. So our EDA went down. Why did it go down? Well, we know that EDA is directly determined, right? So our sweat by the sympathetic nervous system. So if my EDA went down, that means I had to also decrease my parasympathetic, sorry. Uh, I had to decrease my sympathetic nervous system, right? Because they're directly proportional. So EDA goes down, my sympathetic nervous system goes down. All right? Let's stay with, with this idea. and Let's finish arousal then for EDA. So we went from 0.42 to 5.89. So in this case, EDA went up. What caused it to go up? Well, again, it's directly related to the sympathetic nervous system. So if EDA goes up, we have an increase in the sympathetic nervous system. So that goes up. So that's easy. Heart rate's a little more difficult, though. So our heart rate went from 75 down to 62. So we had a decrease in heart rate. That makes sense. During relaxation, we expect both those variables to go down. What caused it? Well, the first question you should ask is, well, what's my heart rate range? I'm below 100. So if you're below 100, it's the parasympathetic system that has the predominance. So we know it's something to parasympathetic. So I know a parasympathetic is controlling this. So I think, okay, what do I do to the parasympathetic to decrease heart rate? Well, it's inverse proportional. So for the relaxation, it's an increase in the parasympathetic that causes a decrease in heart rate. All right, so that one's pretty easy. And then for arousal, heart rate goes up. All right, and this is the one that messes students up a lot of times. Heart rate went up. Person got, uh, you know, banged the book, right? They got scared or startled, whatever you want to say. Heart rate went up, right? Most students go, it's a fight or flight. Yeah, that's occurring, and that's, in fact, leading to the increase in sympathetic. That's leading to the increase in EDA. But that's not having much effect on the heart right now. So remember that the first question you ask is, what's the heart rate range? And again, heart rate only went to 93, which means that, it's still the parasympathetic. So how do I make heart rate go up with the parasympathetic? I decrease it. So it's a decrease in parasympathetic, or sometimes they call it parasympathetic withdrawal. So that's how you go ahead and determine what's happening is the first thing you do is what's the heart rate range, and the second thing you do is you look at what you need to do to that variable to cause the change in heart rate. The other thing is, let's look at this really quick. If I look at the relaxation phase, notice that the parasympathetic is going up, some of that is going down in the arousal phase. They're also going in opposite directions. And that makes sense because they're antagonistic systems. So when one's going up, the other one should be going down. 
right? So that's a nice little check for that. So that concludes the video, I'm pretty sure. And yeah, we're done.